What do you think about some of the uh, the uh, presentations? I was actually blown away with what's being done. I um, again didn't get a chance to go to all four areas, but I learned quite a bit with simulation in the areas of research, uh, both with um, I'm going to say this wrong. I had to, I, luckily I had my uh, iPad because I had to look up some words in vivo. Am I saying that correctly? In vivo simulation research that they're doing with uh, bone and muscle, and then even um, the physical therapy program doing some uh, great research and um, some positive outcomes with. Um, critical thinking, uh, diagnostic reasoning, and wh whatever other buzzwords we use. And I'm going to talk to you a bit more specifically this afternoon about standardized patients and human patient simulation, and I'm going to be able to show you some things that we're doing um, that's exciting at Drexel Nursing and Health Professions. Um, th this is a leftover slide. I think this is probably a bit identical to um, earlier today, and I guess one of the things I wanted to mention this morning that I did not, when I talk about why simulation, um, I know during lunch I had a couple conversations and how do you sell simulation? Um, and, and part of selling simulation, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, it, it'll really put us in the forefront. But is it cost effective? And, and right now, um, I, I just want to spend a minute on how to sell simulation or why to sell simulation. Back in uh, uh, 99, 2000 with the uh, IOM, uh, report saying that um, it's dangerous to be a patient, and I'm, I'm not being facetious, I, I think there's a lot of different dangerous things, but we started to really reflect and examine uh, uh, human error uh, in healthcare. Um, some of the report that comes out that uh, 98,000 medical errors a year, and, and um, I'm coming from a Drexel perspective, so when I say medical, I'm talking about all of us in the, in the same team, nursing, medicine, physical therapy, uh, uh, admissions, all that. Um, 98,000 uh, uh, medical errors a year. That translates, and this is what I find funny, anywhere from about, they're not sure, 35 million on the low side or maybe 29 billion in healthcare cost a year. Um, more people suffer adverse effects from um, medical error, healthcare error, um, than suffering from annual uh, diagnosis of HIV, uh, cancer, and um, I forget what the third uh, medical diagnosis is. And when we think about that, um, one of the great things that the IOM uh, did is help me learn how not just to sell this to my dean, but also to my congressional leaders. Um, there's two things that you want to be able, actually there's one thing that, uh, and no disrespect, um, Congress loves to hear about health care, loves to hear about medicine, loves to hear about a lot of different things, but you have their attention in five seconds when you say the dollar, when you can say that it may save $29 billion a year in health care costs, you've got their attention. And there's a, a research study in the late 90s that the uh, IOM referred to about this, and, and then we can start looking at making it uh, worth its while. And um, how does simulation do that? By giving us that high, either that, um, that high mortality or that low incident type of simulation experience, because uh, my background, I, I mentioned this morning, is not just nursing, but uh, right before I left practice, trauma, uh, surgical trauma, ICU, ER, is, um, you know, I was great on my game, but it was those things I wasn't used to that would bite me, uh, bite me from behind. So we can give uh, experiences to our clinicians uh, across the board of those low occurring incidents um, in simulation. Because you know, you're walking in the ER, and, and I shared it with this morning, you give me a gunshot wound, you give me a train, a literally train wreck with a guy's brains hanging out, I was on my game, I was excited, I knew what to do, I had my team standing by and what have you. Um, we were not an OBGYN hospital, so some uh, young lady come to me uh, in active labor. I was outside of my game and I wanted to transfer pretty quickly, but they could have gotten me comfortable had we had simulation. So that's what I think helps us sell the simulation. Anybody want to disagree or have some insight or thoughts? Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to uh, skip over this. I, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this to about 45 minutes, if that's okay, maybe between 30 minutes and 45 minutes. And basically, one of the things that I'm starting to look at, and it's in my um, references in the back, is this book talking about uh, 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 clinical crisis, crisis management. And it really does little with simulation, but it really uh, starts helping us look at uh, errors, human errors, medical errors, um, from an individual standpoint, from a clinician uh, standpoint, from a... Uh, uh, an organizational uh, standpoint, organizational be the, the operational team, 
and then a management standpoint from the institution as a whole and where are those uh, uh, errors coming from and how can we manage them. And um, I, I think that's what we need to be able to start looking at with simulation as, as well. Because of the complexity of human error, uh, they, I don't know of anyone in, 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 uh, at the bedside or even in, in uh, academic practice, and I better stop and think a minute to make sure that's uh, uh, clinically incompetent or, or if um, they are struggling, uh, that C student, if you will, that we're putting things in, in, uh, in perspective and, and helping them to remediate and get to the comp confident level, the competent level, and hopefully excelling in that area as well. But it's, it's not just the clinical competence skills, it's that human behavior, it's that ability to, to focus on a task while monitoring the entire environment. And that's kind of where the crew uh, resource management comes from in this book I was talking about really was investigating that initially from an airline perspective. Why when the pilot said the plane's going down because I want it to go down and everybody said, well, that's the wrong idea, but since you're the captain of the, the plane, we'll do what you want. Um, but <laughs> I wasn't on that plane. <laughs> um, but looking at uh, hospital uh, uh, decisions, you know, uh, uh, decisions at a, at, a, at a local level in an individual patient versus a hospital level as well. And I'd encourage you, um, it's really opened up my eyes. And I've just, uh, book's been out since 04, I think 05, and I just found it about six months ago. And it's really helping me open up my eyes and sharing with my faculty on how we can begin to change and evaluate that human behavior. Uh, I'll digress for just a minute. Do you remember? Um, I forget the gentleman's name, but it was a, um, a, a member from Congress who was having a discussion, and it was with one of the, uh, the pornographic journals, and I don't want to get too much into it, but someone is going to say, how do, you, how do you define, how do you dictate what is pornography and what is not? And I think, um, the, huh? Justice, Justice Potter. Potter. And it was with uh, Hustler, and it was, I don't know, I can't define it, but I'll tell you when I see it. And I think sometimes in, in, in professionalism, in behaviorism, I don't know, I can't list you right now the steps, the behaviors of professionalism, but I can tell you when I see unprofessional behavior. And I'm not sure from an a, a educational perspective, an adult educator, um, as well as a clinician, that that's fair to my students. I, I have to help them understand, and I won't digress too much about my daughter's behavior, although she is an angel. She's made a, a few couple uh, decisions, and we have a one, uh, one thing that we didn't come to terms with, and that's her, she's 23, and she likes to go out and play cards, and that's my code word. She's going out to play cards, and she does that at bars. She does that with different friends as well, but I don't want to know that she's... Uh, <laughs> But, but when I say that, it's, it's a different uh, time, it's a different uh, generation. And when we're helping our students, our professionals, what is acceptable behavior and what is not, um, I think we need to help them understand clinical behavior, uh, professional behavior, both uh, in the clinical practice as well as in the classroom. And sometimes I think it can change. I'm much more uh, loose in my classroom about uh, people answering phones uh, last few years, uh, working on their computers, not even attending. And, and what have you, because to me, if, if they get what they need to pass, I'm, I'm all for it. But that doesn't translate into clinical practice. What do our patients want to see and hear and our fellow clinicians? So, and, and, and that's a whole other broad spectrum, and, but that, I'd love to discuss that with any of you after. All right, so take a look at that book when you get a chance. And I, uh, so let's, I'm going to dissect first the computerized mannequin. I call, we call it, Drexel, we call it human patient simulation. I like to call it plastics, the full body mannequin. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the standardized patient. I'll just show you a couple of video uh, uh, demonstrations of that. Um, so how do I perform uh, uh, a, a simulation in uh, HPS? Well, if I take my nursing students out to the clinical setting, there's been so much work done before I even go out to the clinical setting. People have researched the clinical site, the hospital. They've, they've done a memo of understanding. They've signed the clinical contracts. We've gone through whatever orientations. There's a lot of work behind the scenes. But what does a clinical day look like? And in my mind, a clinical day is preparation for the clinical day, the actual clinical experience, and some kind of, let's talk about, we call it post-conference or discussion, or truly debriefing of the clinical day. Because sometimes, uh, whether it's just a, a, an interaction that happened versus a, a, some kind of death or some major ethical legal uh, concerns or questions, how do we start as adults to dissect that if we've never been approached by that? So in the human patient simulation experience, you have what I like to call pre-flight briefing. Um, when we in nursing, and that's my perspective, and I could assume that medicine does it, um, 
would you walk a student up to a patient room and say, hi, this is Mr. Rockstraw, go take care of him on their first day of clinical training and walk away? Or would you maybe give them some information in the background and to say, hey, Rocky, on your first day, I want you to perform a head-to-toe assessment. I want you to give me some provisional diagnosis. And, I, and you know what? Uh, uh, so I want you to uh, uh, check the IV out or whatever it might be. So when we start looking at uh, pre-flight, not only should the student be oriented to the environment, be oriented to what your clinical skills or expectations for that simulation is, but they should also be prepared, whether it's days in advance, for the actual procedures that might take place, whether it's some type of surgical procedure or diagnostic procedure, or even just some bedside procedure, like a placement of a catheter or an NG tube or something like that. And I, I talk about orientation and review of objectives. And I, I'll get to that in a minute. The actual simulation and then the debriefing experience as well in there. So um, the educator in me said that I really don't want to know what type of simulation you want to use until I understand what your objectives are. And, and you're going to see this a couple times because I think it's critical. You can do a mental health simulation experience with the plastics. It's a lot of work for my staff. It's a lot of work for you, the faculty member. It's a lot of programming and with minimal benefits or what I would like to call return on your investment. So I, I think when I'm looking at an individual student perspective, individual skills, uh, individual objectives, I really kind of uh, point my faculty in the direction of the standardized patient versus what I call group work or teamwork, the, the communication um, and, and uh, crisis resource management. And even uh, in leadership, I point them a little bit more, I, don't, I kind of force them towards the, uh, the HPS side. And I'll give an example. On a, uh, we're on our fourth year of a five-year grant working with faculty and in integrating technology um, in nursing uh, curriculum. And this is down in Washington, D.C. I won't give you the actual site. Um, and we, uh, for our third year, we, we, our first year, we focused more on handheld technologies and online learning, and then we kind of jumped into simulation our second year. And after our third year of going through simulation, through simulation, through simulation, um, I, um, just with the faculty, I had five PhD nurses um, uh, uh, go in there and do a basic uh, uh, nursing simulation. And w during the debriefing, what we discussed and what we realized is they very quickly fell into the same uh, attitudes and the same roles that our students do that they get nervous and they don't want to uh, be disrespectful to a fellow nurse and when a fellow nurse was, uh, was, was confused or delayed or, or something they didn't want to um, uh, embarrass that nurse or communicate correctly or they heard something incorrectly and rather than uh, uh, try to clarify it ended up patient harm. They actually harmed my simulator. Now, again, it was just temporary, but it was unusual and it was really an eye-opener for us to be able to talk about how useful it can be to open up the minds of what I call closed-loop communication. Do you all practice that here where in an in a event, uh, uh, communication's repeated three times? Where a communication might be, uh, I might be having a, a, a pretty big event, let's say a code, and I need someone to get me a code cart. I don't say, hey, can someone get me a code cart? Whereas closed-loop communication would be, um, Joe, I need you to get me a crash cart. And Joe would say, Rocky, you want me to go get the crash cart? I'll say, yes, Joe, I want you to get the crash cart. That way, as the team leader, I have a task, I identified it, I've delegated it, he's explained to me, he understands what I want to get, or if what he gave back to me was not quite clear, I could clarify it, then I, when I repeat it back a third time, it's off my to-do list. And I might say, and also, let me know when you return it. Because I might be so busy, Joe brings it in here, I may not uh, uh, be aware that he brought it in here, and it could be five or ten minutes before I'm aware that it's there. And that's important to practice, not just for our, our students, but I think at the bedside as well. Um, what does a human patient simulation uh, scenario look like? So um, there's a different ways to write it, but basically this is a recipe. I don't cook. Uh, the folks I went out with last night, we, we had a long discussion. I really don't cook. We don't want to get into it. Even if you gave me a recipe, I can't cook. But if you give me a, a, a simulation uh, a recipe here, I can help you design. You're the content expert. You want to come in to me with your objectives. This is what I would design as, as your uh, assist you to, to take that objectives and that student learning or that participant learning and translate it into building a scenario for you. And I want you to notice what that second uh, checklist item is and it's required. Not just what is the environment that you kind of are looking for, but I want to know what your objectives are because they guide not just the development but the measuring, the, the outcomes. What do you want to see at the end of this simulation so we can begin to help you to, to, um, to, uh, to not to measure those, but to design those measurements, if you will, in a technical uh, standpoint. Um, 
you want to kind of give a general summary? Because again, if, um, how many educators, at least part-time educators, do we have in here? Maybe not full. -time. Okay. Uh, thanks. Now raise your hand. Do you use lesson plans? Do you create lesson plans and objectives and times and videos and all those different things? And um, and and why do we do that? So if I should be ill one day. I could hand it to Joe and say, Joe, I'm not feeling real well. Can you take my next hour of class? And he could very quickly look at it, and he may not be um, that comfortable in, in giving the nursing process, but he'd be able to follow my lesson plan. And that's what we're doing with simulation at, at Drexel is the ability to create these lesson plans and simulation so any faculty can come in, take a quick look at the lesson plan, and that's what the summary does. That's what the script does. So not only the faculty who'd be the, the leader and the, the lead uh, chief, if you will, like we call them scenario chiefs, uh, to be able to run it very quickly. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. But also the script my staff uses to, in their design as well as if they're uh, uh, becoming some of the, uh, the players within the simulation as well. And we script it all out. Uh, there's equipment and supplies. Because again, you know, I equate it to when, um, you know, a, a, to me, a coli is a cholecystectomy, removal of gallbladders, or removal of the gallbladders, or removal of the gallbladder. I don't work in the OR. If you work in the OR, there are 15 different ways to remove that gallbladder, at least more importantly, how you set up your, tra uh, your surgical trays, am I saying that right? How you set up your instruments, the, 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 lo the level or type of suturing or what have you. It's uh, physician preference cards. So what we do with these is we call them actually uh, uh, faculty preference cards on what they want to do with the simulation. They want an IV pump, do they want what type of IV uh, fluid, what type of uh, uh, size bags or what have you, so that my uh, assistant, when she's not faxing or answering my phones and we're busy, she can go grab this uh, uh, scenario card and set up a simulation that either A, we forgot about, or B, it was scheduled last minute and we don't need to pull someone else out from an active scenario. The uh, events, and I talk about measuring performance and I won't get too much into that, but we, we need to begin, as in medicine, we need to begin in nursing to be able to, to objectively measure student competency. We've got a long ways to go to get where we need to be, but we need to start today at the basic level and to start defining what is clinical competence in a Foley catheterization, what is clinical competence in uh, a bedside assessment, and begin to measure that objectively. And, and we can do that, I believe, beginningly in simulation. And then uh, as what other equipment as well that you want in your simulation. Here are some of the scenarios that we actually use within our curriculum. We do both medical surgical, women's health. Med surge, we're still kind of gradually moving into that. Women's health, because of a lack of clinical sites, we're forced, I'm happy, we're forced that um, out of our 10 uh, clinical days, 20% um, are now simulation days. Two, two out of the 10 experiences are simulation because we just don't have the women's health sites in the Philadelphia area. Many nursing programs are vying for them and, and the student population is growing. So that's kind of exciting to be able to do. Critical care, we're taking simulation on the road, sort of, for them. Instead of requiring them and the students to come to us, we'll, we, uh, in critical care, in our advanced med surge three, we'll bring the simulator to the classroom here, set it up here. So again, what we need to do is not just reserve this classroom for the actual class time, reserve it two hours early so we can come down and get set up so that we can run it. My staff then deploy down here to run it behind the scenes or what have you. Or we also, in my preferences, to run it up there, ask for three or four volunteers, run up there, you guys watch it live here, come down here and debrief, and while you're debriefing, my staff's up there cleaning up, getting set up for something else, and that's just kind of in my, my idea. We take it on the road, not just an IT setup like this, but we take it to classrooms that aren't set up for IT, uh, as long as we've got some type of internet access, which we're, we're, we're beginning to change how things look. Home health, we're actually doing a home health community simulation as well, um, uh, where they're uh, going and assessing a family member. They have uh, I, uh, they've got this little robotic cat. It's not really a robotic cat, but whatever it does, it jumps, it flips, and what have you. And the reason they even have the cat in there is because it ha somehow interacts with the patient in the disease process. There's uh, kitty droppings and what have you and all that other stuff. But it's important things to assess when you're looking at the uh, patient's overall health in the home setting. And we actually um, do disaster preparedness. Um, and really what it is is it's three separate uh, simulations for our students where they uh, go in and assess a uh, mannequin with either um, ex uh, trauma from an explosion, radiation, or some type of chemical uh, 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 interaction for um, a biological type of warfare. Okay, um, so here is um, our, our uh, multidiscipline 
simulation that we've had here. You'll see um, our, our patient actor, so she's a hybrid. She's actually a human, and you'll see that during the video, but she actually has, <laughs> she actually has a, a, a pelvis, uh, not only her own, but a, 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 a mechanical one between her legs as well, and she's actually um, holding the baby within the pelvis and not releasing it. She's got a, a headset so that the scenario chief can tell her what to do with it, how to push it forward or move it around and what have you. To her left, is I think it's a mother, it might be a partner, but I think it's a mother. I think Heidi, who's the patient, is actually, uh, her character is somewhat developmentally delayed, and you'll see that in her, her re reaction. Then we have nursing students, we have uh, nurse practitioner students, we have actual nurse practitioners, we have um, PAs, and we might have an anesthesia in this. So I'll just have you take a look at this, and just look at the interaction, and you'll see only three, um, three confederates, the patient, the patient's mom, and then in the top, on the forefront left, the, the, the white lab coat with the kind of blonde bob, I think she's a faculty in here, and she's kind of standing back as well. Yeah. Hi. Can I just have you very much? Ariana, I'm going to check your cervix, okay? My name is Dr. Musselman. I'm one of the, the doctors here. Okay. What do you want during her name? Her, her name's Maria. And date of birth? Her date of birth is 4-21-67. And, sure. All right, does she have any allergies right. She's not allergic to anything. All right. Her service is a push. Her, 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 Push, 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 mom, push. Push for me. Push, 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 push. Keep pushing. No, I'm not stepping away. Come on, big push. I am helping her. Okay. So I'm going to put these spoons on the baby's head. These tongs in the baby. What, what is wrong? Why isn't the baby coming out? Just go around the baby's head. Just pull the baby out. Good, good, good. good, good. Yeah, push, mom. Another, somebody coach mom with pushing. Push. Deep push. 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 And push. 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 A little harder. Push a little harder. There we go. Big, big breath. Come on, baby's coming. Easy, baby's coming out. Here we go, mom. Pushing. All of that. Come on, a little bit. Big push. There we go. Come on. I'm with that. Push, keep pushing. Come on, matching. There we go. Come on, Come on, watch the patient. It was an initial shoulder dystocia, right? Um, um, my oh, my now she's actually been experiencing the first post hemorrhage or hemorrhage bleed. Is that right? Post delivery bleed. She she does, she has a little bit of asthma. Yes. Yeah. What's the matter with her? Now she doesn't look so good. Okay. Are you okay? Take a deep breath. Mom, what do you think about this? There were a couple of cues built into that. Heidi, the mom, the patient, was actually holding on to the uh, the baby and would not release it till certain things were done. And I don't know if you saw that, but uh, the um, I, I think it was either a woman's health resident, uh, the young lady in the white shirt, or it might have been a nurse practitioner in women's health. But um, they were waiting for, for uh, them to call the attending. No matter how many things they did right, they wanted them to get comfortable to call their boss in for some assistance and for some help. And, and I guess my staff cut that piece out. But that was one of the cues they built in here because we wanted the students to get comfortable to be uncomfortable and ask for help. I'm just going to show you a couple clips in here. Are you having any pain in here? What? Are you having any pain here, girl? In my head. My head hurts so much. Okay, next one. Okay. Can you try wiggling your hands for me? Yeah, okay. Try it. Squeak my hands. 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 Squeak my hands.
All right, we offer for um, uh, simulation lab directors, uh, both nursing, um, we've not had physicians come yet, physician assistants and others across the country. And we've actually had a few across the world, two from South Africa, Turkey, a few from Canada, Puerto Rico. Well, they come in and they're immersed in simulation for a week and kind of how to run a, a center like we run it. And this is the, is anyone uh, coming to our program in the next year? And the only reason I ask is I'm, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. We immerse them. So if they're going to be responsible for simulations, if they're going to create simulations, if they're going to debrief it, we want them to experience it like a student does. So in the middle of my uh, prestigious lecture, um, our facilities guys, I think, in here uh, interrupted and said, we were out of medical staff and nursing staff, and we need help in, in uh, this disaster preparedness. And um, we run them into the sim center, I give them the objectives, tell them what we want to cover. And, and just uh, for 20 minutes, they have to take, they're overloaded with uh, patient injuries and what have you. And um, I think a lot of them get frustrated. Uh, a lot of them realize that it's for fun, but they get frustrated. They, they um, give us a lot of feedback on what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. But I think what it translates into is uh, getting that feel what it's like to be a student, what it's like to be put in that environment. Um, even as a practitioner, what it would be to be required to kind of have to show my, my uh, competency. Online, wanted to report yeah, it as the hospital she's reporting afterwards. Actually, waking up, my assistant is in the front of the back. I'm going to be having the test wrapped on that side. I have black work courses, so we built the courses for our faculty, oh, okay. kind of the center. Yeah. Um, and then you see my uh, web administrators and the scrubs with the camera uh, as well, and they're just taking pictures for, uh, for, for prosperity. So. And there's uh, Brenda Bottom, left hand corner, she's one of our faculty. I, um, here's the definition, uh, actually uh, Dr. Wallace has this, what is a standardized patient, um, and it's basically someone who's coached to simulate an actual patient uh, and, and provide that time and time and time again, and that simulation cannot be detected from a, uh, a skilled clinician. Uh, now again, if, if, if I'm taking a blood pressure, I'm going to be able to tell the difference between a normal blood pressure and a high blood pressure, but behaviorally with depressions or hyperactivity or what have you, if you, uh, with training, it's very hard for a, a skilled clinician, and I'm, and I'm not putting any, they are able to come across as whatever we're trying to portray. It's not easy to get there. A little bit different in, uh, with the, 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 the scenario set up in that, again, there's a pre-briefing. I think you need to have two sets of objectives, the overall teaching objectives, what as a clinician I want to see my, my end results are. I think student or participant behavior so they know what we expect to go in there. Because I've had students walking sometimes, especially with the um, HPS, and they kind of just sit there with their arms folded. And afterwards, we talk to them, what are you waiting for? They go, well, you know, we're waiting for a critical event. You're probably going to make the patient crash or code or something. And we're just kind of waiting for that. And, and we don't do that in real life when we're taking care of real patients. So um, I think there needs to be some uh, student behavior so they know what to expect when they go in the room. There's the actual encounter, and I'll define a little bit more in the next couple slides. But the post-encounter is different. It's not just a debriefing. The post-encounter, it kind of there's three pieces to a post-encounter, and I can run uh, uh, every hour, every half hour uh, simulated environments, and I stay on schedule. That post-encounter is a chance where when the student steps out, the participant steps out of the room, that gives the actor, without any interruption, a five or six minute period to document what they saw and what they didn't see. And as a faculty, they designed, do you want it to say something as simple as done or not done? Done, not done, or done incorrectly? And the ability for them to go in there and, and actually um, document a little bit. And, and with uh, uh, education, we, we sometimes will key with our, our uh, actors. For instance, when our uh, undergraduate nursing students, if they even think about checking for true business, I don't care if they do it wrong, we give them credit for doing it. Versus if you're a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, the actor knows that it, the, the uh, actual exam has to be done correctly in, in the manner that we give them those criteria for. After they are done uh, grading the student, the student may at the same time, whether it be in, not graded, I'm sorry, documented on, no, my faculty cringe when I say graded, only faculty grade, actors don't, they document. The student may be outside the room, documenting, taking a survey, actually taking a, a post-experience quiz or test or what have you, uh, typing up a quick note, and that can be done as well in the, in the software that you may use that uh, integrate the videos as well as with the actor's documentation as well as with the students are done at the same time. Five or six minutes, students invited back in the room for feedback. The actor steps out of the uh, role of the patient and will say what went well, what didn't go well, um, both from an interpersonal uh, 
perspective as well as a, a, a clinical assessment. Maybe you didn't listen to, for a full inspiratory, expiratory when you listened to my lungs, whatever we give them criteria for our students as well. Provide them feedback for about five minutes. They leave, they have a couple minutes to relieve their bladder, clean the room and get ready for the next experience as well. Again, with the patient actor, it's individual, interpersonal communication, data collection, history taking, physical assessment, educating the patient. Now, what we did was we first started with the standardized patient experience with our, our college of medicine back in the early um, 2000, 2001. And I think mostly or largely because of their um, technology, their software, their um, scripts were presented as a, a, a medical H&P, a health and physical. Um, and, and as a clinician, I can read it and I can find anything I need. But we were trying to build to create scripts for an actor, not a healthcare provider, but for an actor. So what we did was we, um, when we started uh, uh, built our own center, we kind of modified and we couldn't, we couldn't change anything. If, uh, we, if, we, if we tried to deviate from the H&P uh, model, um, it didn't work and, and we just, we, we, it just didn't work. And so when we were looking at our software, that was one of the uh, uh, factors that we looked into it. So th we had a couple actors work with us and we designed this template, this recipe for creating a scenario for a standardized patient setting, scenario, a door sign on the outside. That gives a student an objective, how much time they have, what we're looking for you to do, the name of the patient. We try to make it very generic. Fran, Fran can be male or female, depending on what the case is and what have you. Um, questions to ask the students. Should the students not ask them? We, we train them with specific questions if it's germane to the case. It's, it's kind of pat answers, what they'll respond to, uh, smoking, how many children, are your parents alive? If it's not germane to the case, we, we tell the SPs just to use whatever their normal family history is or what they would normally do. Um, their, what their dress and attire is, and then when we talk about the events or grading. Again, they really don't grade how well the student does something or not. We actually brief them if, if it was either done or not done. And, and yes, after a full day's events, towards the afternoon of time and time and time again, we let our uh, standardized patients know that if you, they're pretty good at remembering what happened just transpired the last half hour, but if they forget, we tell them to give the student uh, a, a credit for it if they can't remember. Um, if there's something unusual that they, they're struggling with, they'll put a comment within that one event for us to go back and look at as, as well. So we do uh, 15 case scenarios. That actually is 15 minutes of the actual scenario followed by a 15 minute post encounter where it's just taking a history for our, stu our undergraduate nursing students. Um, or just a, a specific physical exam, patient teaching and ethical dilemmas. We've done ethical dilemmas for uh, like with HIV where um, the doctor just wrote some discharge orders, you go back in to share that with the patient. And the ethical dilemma is when they talk about getting your family uh, tested and treated, the patient flatly refuses because he knows HIPAA or she knows HIPAA and they doesn't want their partner, their wife, their family member to know about it. And it, as a healthcare provider, um, we would work with the patient, they're probably in shock as a brand new student, they may not know about it and they might get pretty defensive and saying you're crazy, you've got to tell them, you have no right to keep that. And again, we'd rather do that error, experience that error with an actor rather than with a real patient. We've done other ethical dilemmas with a DNR versus do not treat. We've uh, another ethical dilemma which is kind of difficult is assisted suicide. A patient's coming in, a doctor just left, he asks the nurse, hey, can you get me you know, something to kind of help me go, get rid of the pain, I just, I'm ready to check out and everything and how do they deal with that, which is, I think, kind of fun, but it, it's a struggle because you're really starting to, to have them start to reach down deep. This one here is a neat one, and um, John is uh, actually uh, my, my, one of my coordinators of the lab of the SP program, and what he's doing here is he's playing a, 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 not a narcotic, uh, uh, a chemically induced, or what do they call it, a nurse, uh, impaired nurse. Um, and what they've actually done with the simulation was the, the student was invited, to come into the simulation. This is a standardized patient experience, but what all the student knows is you're gonna receive report and it may be a little difficult. That's all they heard is report, getting report from the nurse, may be a little difficult, and this is that nurse's first day on the job. Unknown to the student, they poured alcohol on John so he could smell like alcohol. And, <laughs> and so watch, watch this scenario. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. You're, um... I'm Christiana. Christiana. Yeah. yeah. You started uh, a little started. bit ago? Yeah. So, is this like your first full day shift, or...? Um, yeah. Yeah, by myself. Oh, wow. That must be exciting. It is. How was your night? Oh, it was tough. It was tough. Yeah. Here, wait. I got you a cup of coffee. 
Thanks. All right, because you know you got to have that first thing in the morning. Oh, with me right there. Give me a cup of coffee. I'm so, sorry. no, it was a rough night. I just have a couple of things to finish up. Okay. And then I can give you a report on the patients you're going to have. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and um, uh, I'll let you know what's going on with that. We just have to do a couple of things. Are I have you sure to... you're okay? You're kind of sweaty. No, I'm I'm okay. It was a, it was really tough. We had we had like three drunks in. We just have to do a wasting. Does that that smell? I kind of smell alcohol a little bit. Well, yeah. He barked all over my shoes and um. He's... And um, so we were trying to give him two Percocets, two Percocets mm -hmm. and um, um, he refused them. And uh, Marlene, who was here last night with me, um, we wasted it, and I just need to get somebody to sign it off, was really. Uh, so he refused it, uh -huh. and um, Marlene um, saw that I, that I threw it out. I put it in the... Um, in the med room, in the, um, you know, it says, uh, that, you know, you're supposed to put it in the right, um, yeah. um, uh, oh, the, um, well, I put it in the sharps container. Okay, okay. Where, are you where sure we, you're okay? I'm Your fine, thoughts are I'm kind fine. of... No, no, I'm good, I'm good. I, I can't sign off on them, though. Well, yeah, well, you just you just witnessed the fact that I threw them out, and then we'll go over and get report on the band. I didn't see you throw them out, though. I know, but you know, this is kind of the way we do it. It's like Marlene and I threw it out, but she's already gone. She's getting her kids at a bus stop. Yeah. And I got to get mine um, in the next few minutes. I, I can't. I'm well, sorry. They, I, I mean, they just told us, you know, at orientation. Oh, orientation. Those guys, they couldn't orient out of a paper bag. You know how that is. They, uh, I, I mean, what we have to do sometimes around here just to get everything squared away is to, we just, sometimes we back each other up. Yeah, I can't, I just don't feel comfortable. I'm, well, I mean. I'm sorry. I mean, that's what we do because. I, I really don't feel comfortable. I'm yeah, sorry. Crying out loud. I mean, is this the way it's going to be? you got to be careful getting in on the ground floor like this because before you know it, nobody will watch your back. I, I, I mean, I'm a good guy. I'll, I, I'll give you 15 oh, yeah. chances and, you know, whatever, but you've got to really. You know, you gotta be careful. I just, I can't. I, I don't feel right doing this. I'm sorry. We're gonna be here forever, if, and I've gotta get out of here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, Tom walks the nurse manager. Hi. Good morning, Sue. How are you? Hi. Yeah. I hear some voices. How's everything going? Hey. Hi. How's it? Yeah. You finished up for orientation? Yes. Yeah. yeah Chris, and she's. Uh, we're gonna give a report in just a second. We just were logging out. I thought. I thought that somebody was trying to give us a hard time, maybe in the emergency room. Uh, well, some of the patients have been a pain. We had some of them last night, but you know. You you look like, if you don't mind my expression, hell. Thanks. Yeah. We, we, we just have to problem. sign out. Uh, we're at the, you know, she just a... So, um, um, a couple things about this. Um, although John works with me and, and, and is known to me, um, John is faculty, but John's primary position is within the sim lab. And um, uh, Sue... The Just out of curiosity, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing that she stood her ground, and I'm thinking, wow, that's pretty good. She's probably a, a senior nursing student there. Would you believe that she was in the beginning of her junior year, just barely halfway through? Um, and again, this was very real to her. She realized that it was a simulated environment. Um, they had no clue to it, and I thought she did pretty good at standing her ground of not signing the, the waste of narcotic. Um, I've had some real experiences of things like this in my practice, and I'll tell you, it's, it's never been... Um, a, a, a fun environment. It's never been a pretty environment. Um, and I'm probably one of the few, but my, my military training in me is says the second I smell alcohol or, or something like that, if something's not right, and the answer I get does not make sense, I, I don't think about it. I automatically notify uh, the investigative and prove it wrong or prove it right. But that's far and few between, I think, in, in, in civilian practice and what have you. But they drill that in, the, in, in, in your head sometimes in, in, in the military because of the uh, um, the importance of not just patient care, but my primary job in the military was to go to war and, and, and to make the, the soldier better quickly so he or she can go back and kill more people. Um, and when I'm impaired, I can't do that so well. But um, I, I thought she did a pretty good job here. Some of our, our full comprehensive uh, standardized patient experience in the traditional, what I would call OSCE, what you might experience as a, as a medical student or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. And we require our nursing students to go through the, the same uh, uh, examination, uh, whether it's a COPD, MI, myocardial infarction, excuse me, pancreatitis and different things. But um, as a pre-licensure nursing student, or as an undergraduate uh, nursing student or a nurse, we don't diagnose. But we definitely 
think clinical reasoning and we educate our patient and we measure that clinical reasoning by what they educate the, the patient to. So if they go in there and they're by investigating and asking questions, they say this is diabetic, we tell them that we want to make a recommendation to the patient on what type of lab test they should be asking for by the physician, like a, a hemoglobin A1C or blood glucose monitoring. And I know it sounds kind of crazy, but it lets us know that they're beginning that, taking step, uh, collecting information and taking that step on what they think it might be saying. Uh, again, I mentioned the ethical dilemmas that we do, uh, HIV, assisted suicide, communicating bad news. And um, I, I think I mentioned earlier this morning about the um, couples and family therapy where they take that family of four through eight uh, episodic visits. Our physical therapy, one of the first things they did with their, uh, which was kind of exciting, is they uh, created a case of a patient uh, b being discharged from physical therapy outpatient care, and through makeup, through moulage, they created old bruises and new bruises mm -hmm. so that they were to identify some possible abuse, um, uh, a spousal abuse. But the student, before they go into the room, is saying, you're getting ready to, oh, this is a VIP. They're, they're briefed by the... Uh, the chair of the program that this is uh, the the, uh, the director of surgery of the hospital's wife and, and we've got to treat her very well, we've got to do this and other things. And then uh, how do they deal with that uh, in, in trying to explore is, is this that she just uh, falls down a lot or is there some kind of spousal abuse going on? Creative arts and therapy, we have a, a, from our Hahnemann days, we have a, a arts therapy, dance therapy, and music therapy. And what they do in our simulation program is their students have to do an intake evaluation of a patient with a schizophrenic break. Um, I get tired just watching that actor uh, uh, for 15 minutes trying to interact and respond to the, uh, the interview. And, and I, I think they're making great strides with that and, and having some fun with it as well. Um, this is just communicating bad news. I, I'm going to pass this video, but basically what happens is a, uh, a nurse practitioner Actually, I'm going to show the first couple, uh, 20 seconds, because listen to um, um, the congratulations. Uh, what happened was there was a birth. Um, uh, the, the baby swallowed some meconium. Not the right thing to do, not the normal thing. It happens um, and uh, has transferred going to the, uh, the NICU and going to be intubated. And, and the discomfort of this nurse practitioner student uh, to develop that first uh, relationship. And listen how she does that uh, about the birth of the baby. Come in, please. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? Um, not good at all. I mean, where's where's our son? I'm sorry. Are you Miss Sanchez? Yes. Yes. And are you Mr. Sanchez? Um, or? I'm, I'm great. Sorry. Are you the father of the baby? Father. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm yes. Jen. Hi. I'm a nurse Hello. practitioner. Sandra, the Hi. nurse. Okay. What are your questions right now? Well, what do you guys know? What's going on? First of all, congratulations. Yeah, but she. I, I was there for the birth, on the and baby. she said that. That's Showing the baby was blue, discomfort. she didn't touch the baby, and they ran out of the room with the baby. Okay. That's all we know. What happened was when you came in, you delivered, the baby swallowed um, stool. When babies are inside mom, oh sometimes God. they poop. That's and that's actually been one of our more difficult simulations with our, uh, our nurse practitioner students, is getting them comfortable, might not be the right word, to, to sharing uh, bad news. Uh, uh, with them, it's very difficult. And, and um, this scenario is actually uh, uh, jumped into where there's two keywords, uh, as, as, especially after a death, we have a, a, a fetal death, uh, a, a birth. And um, what, what the SPs are, are geared towards is they escalate. And, and um, unless the nurse practitioner either uses the word death or dying, only those two words, they get a little bit more irate, a little bit more irate, even to the fact of, you know, they passed on or they, they, they're, they're no longer with us. And, you know, I don't understand what do you mean passed on, I, you know, whatever that might be. And we've actually had to uh, debrief the emotional component more because it's difficult to communicate that bad news and, and, and how do you do that when, when you're not used to it. Um, I'm going to spend about the next five minutes or less of a little bit about uh, a debriefing, theori uh, a theoretical definition of debriefing, and I've got two or three of them here for you. And basically what it does is just taking and dissecting and peeling back an experience, trying to understand it, and dealing with an emotional component, dealing with what actually happened, whether it was good or bad, and what are we going to do about it to, to, to hopefully prevent it from happening again. And, and um, it, it's just taking uh, linking actions, uh, theory, uh, th theoretical framework and trying to help me get on my game, if you will. 
it, uh, debriefing kind of uh, initially comes out of psychology, comes out of, of um, uh, education, comes out of the military as well. And in the military debriefing, I, I, I always like that, but the military debriefing is very different. You didn't kill enough people, get, get back in there and do it better, and how can you do it better so we can win the war and get out of here? Not quite like that, but we're really looking at it from a perfectionist perspective, and I think that's how we in, in, in healthcare should be looking at it as well. Um, but it's appraising what it was my knowledge, what was my skills, what was my task, what was I lacking on as well. And there really needs to be an emotional recovery because we're human. We're all human beings, and, and, and whether we, we like it or not, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, um, there's um, emotions tied to, to our behaviors, tied to our experiences, and we have to create a safe environment to be able to start sharing that as well. Um, Dr. Rudolph, Jenny Rudolph out of uh, Harvard Medical School, um, talks about debriefing, and uh, Harvard's doing a great job at something calling debriefing with good judgment. Um, it's also called advocacy inquiry, and, and um, it, it's a great tool. It's one of many tools, but it's a tool that's gaining uh, um, uh, wide popularity across the country. And what it's doing is this tool is actually helping um, the participant to break down that wall and start to describe and start to get at the, what they call frames of learning, being able to get past what I saw, what I expected to see, and can you help me understand and link those two together. And again, it's looking at that emotional component, how you're feeling, not just how you're feeling, how, how are you feeling this minute? Are you excited? Are you, are you sad? Are you angry? Let's at least acknowledge it. And there's actually some research being done in there that until I have the ability or a human has the ability to put a, a, a word to that emotion, I can't get past her and start dealing with the constructive piece of fixing what I, I broke. So I may be feeling angry, but if, if you give me the chance to say I'm angry, um, uh, psychologically it's beginning to give me the ability to get past that anger, start calming down that anger, um, and then start working on what I made mistakes on. I'm trying to use that at home, but I don't get a chance to say how I'm feeling. <laughs> um, but my daughter said, you're doing that AI thing again, aren't you, Dad? <laughs> All right, uh, some best practices um, in debriefing. Now, again, best practices are just that. We, we may not be able to, to provide it because of either my experience or even with my experience because of the facilities. But um, there's been some research done uh, both with nursing and medicine. And when I debrief, you want to debrief away from the action, in a quiet room away from the simulator, uh, in a quiet room away from where uh, the patient activity took place. I want to come back to the ability to review, but it, it's great. I have found in, in my uh, working with my students the ability to review. So when I say to my student, I notice you didn't check the, na uh, the patient's name badge. Oh, yes, I did. Well, we could get into a discussion for 15 minutes that they did or didn't do, when they did it, or what have you. But I go, oh, well, maybe I'm mistaken. Let's look at the video and watch what happens, see what happened. So then we really focus on what happens. But I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Uh, a, a place to safely discuss thoughts and feelings. Um, we're struggling at Drexel. Do you have a faculty member debrief the student? Is that student comfortable with a faculty member rather than a facilitator? And what I mean by facilitator is maybe I don't want a women's health faculty member debriefing a women's health student because that student might feel it, their grades tied into it or they can't be completely open and honest. They give you the answer to what you're looking for rather than the answer that they're really experiencing or feeling. Um, and you've got to build into time to share uh, for learning and discovery. It can't be forced. It can't be quick. Um, and then the goal should be safe in uh, uh, a safety briefing, um, exploring the topic at hand. I'm going to show another video. It's, it's less than a minute. I've got to set this up. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, an attention test. And if you've seen this, I'm going to ask that you sit back and not make a comment, not, not ooh, ah, oh, yeah, I've seen this. Or, or, or if you've not seen it, and then all of a sudden something unusual happens, try not to respond until after the video is over. Now, do I have your uh, uh, interest sparked? Now, this is used in education across the country. So as clinicians, if you're a clinician, what I'm going to ask is during this video, when it starts, I'm also going to ask you to multitask. So I'd like you to take your pulse, and I want you to be able to count your pulse as well as while you're doing this test, OK? I'm serious. <laughs> if you know how to take a pulse, just pretend. Just simulate. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Begin.
How many passes did you count? Anybody? 12? 15? 14? 14? 16? Anything else? 12, 14, 16, 15? 13? I'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> and if you didn't have a pulse, I hope you felt comfortable enough to call out. <laughs> All right, now here comes the next part. The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? Yes. <laughs> All right, um, the reason, um, as a clinician, I had you, uh, uh, first time I experienced it, they had me count my pulse, and I was livid that I missed that gorilla. But I think many times as a clinician, we multitask, and we multitask well. But one of the things with uh, uh, crisis resource management or crew uh, resource management is if I'm the team leader, I can't get task specific. The task specific was counting how many times they passed the basketball. But if I was the leader and I got involved on that one task, I can't see the gorilla in the room. And I'm paid to see that gorilla in that room. And, 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 and so what was challenging about that, especially as a clinician, is, is it, of course I can manage a patient code. Of course I can manage a, a, the ER patient or what have you. But um, sometimes we have to be very careful with that because what if I need a central line or an IV and no one else can do it, I'm the clinician, I'm going to jump there and do that. Uh, that one time and the time that's going to get us in the behind either by a lawsuit or possibly my ability to continue uh, practicing is that gorilla is going to show up the one time I take my eye off, off the, the overall piece. And all this is showing us is that we're human and that not all of us can, can multitask and, and get specific as well. So that, one of the reasons I like the reason to, uh, to, to, to review, and this is one of the things I, I kind of sold my dean on it, was because the software and hardware I wanted to use to build my sim center of just the audiovisual was close to half a million dollars. And, and she, she didn't freak out, but she basically told me, like she does many times, go back and get me something cheaper. Go back and get me something cheaper. And, and for whatever I wanted to do, there are cheaper is a bad word, but uh, what we're able to do, and, and, and this really helps sell the ability for me to focus on the debriefing piece and not struggling with the students what was seen and what wasn't seen. Just briefly, very briefly, I'm sorry about that, it was a long five minutes, um, there's just a couple examples of the documentation of what, was, what the student accomplished, what they didn't accomplish for them to be able to see. This here was actually um, from a standardized patient perspective encounter. The student either did or didn't do something, whether it's introduce himself, good eye contact, uh, speaks clearly and a uh, patient can understand. We actually use what we call the three strike rules. Should the uh, student use medical terminology, cholecystectomy, uh, appendectomy, the student will go, what? What's that? Should this, uh, they give them three strikes. If they only done it once or twice, they get a pass. Should they use medical terminology um, a third time or more, then they get a, 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 no, a not pass on that one area as well. Uh, they can use the medical terminology, but if they follow it up, uh, have you ever had a cholecystectomy or a removal of your gallbladder, that's, that's okay. Um, and, and again, um, this is for undergraduate nursing students, but we can, uh, we can detail this um, as general or as detailed as you want to get us. Did the student listen to your lungs, done or not done? Did the, listen, did the student listen to your lung in, in 18 uh, different spaces, done or not done? Did the student listen bilaterally, done or not done? Did the student listen full inspiratory and full expiratory? So depending on what you want to be able to measure, we're beginning to do that objectively for you. This is what I love. Um, this is feedback to you, the faculty member. Our software is able to aggregate and give you information. And what that is, left to right, and I am colorblind, but I believe there's a, a bright um, red um, and, then a, and then a pink in the bar graph. The pink is what was not done. Um, the red is what, what was done. So if you look at the pink very quickly, I'm looking for what my students did not do. Very quickly, I, I go over to question five, and 61% of my students didn't do Q5. So they didn't ask the patient's age. So that's not really telling me that my students, uh, maybe my students don't know what's going on. I think more importantly, it's telling me that I didn't get that to the students, the importance of asking their age in this one scenario. If you look over to the far uh, right, Q14, 52% of my students didn't do this. Q14 is ask about the history of palpitations. So that really gives me quick feedback today 
not when I do my final exam, not when I get my evaluation back and they're gone and at their next. Tonight, after their simulation experience, I know where my students' weaknesses are or not, and I can readjust my curriculum tomorrow and tell them about the importance of asking about palpitations or asking about uh, past medical histories. Uh, and I think it's great feedback that we can provide to you in a simulation environment. Um, this is just a, a screen overlay. Um, this is a still picture, but what I like about this for feedback is um, the students can watch themselves in the simulation environment, and overlaid is a patient monitor. As you can see, a heart rate, uh, uh, arterial blood gas lines, um, uh, different things as well. So the student can begin to correlate what they're seeing with the patient, what they're seeing with their actions, and what's going on in the monitor as well in case something is not going on there. Just a, a different perspective. It looks a little busy, but I kind of like it with my ICU background because it really helps me be able to put all three of those together without trying to see them on two or three different screens. Video overlay. Um, they offer this in, a, in, in the Laridol product. Um, I don't think, I, I actually use, um, there's different vendors that offer this total solution for a complete audiovisual capturing system. We use uh, EMS, Educational Management Solution. I think they're working on providing this, but again, because of the feedback from folks like me that we, we want this for our students, our PAs and our nurse practitioners. This is just a debriefing form from that HPS as well. And what this does, again, is that input-output. Anytime that a student interacts with the patient, whether it's checking a pulse, shocking the patient, uh, doing certain things, checking some vital signs, this gives them a chronological order of what they did, what they performed in this patient's response, so they can begin to dissect that and, and experience and, 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 and try to do that critical reasoning thing, that, that critical thinking. What's going on? Why did I take a set of vital signs? If I did take a set of vital signs, where was my response? Why did it take nine minutes to start CPR when I, when I called the code and different things like that to be able to start to uh, the debriefing process? Um, this is just a, a debriefing uh, a scenario. I'm going to pass on this, but basically what this is, this is one of our creative arts and therapy uh, student on the right. The uh, couple in the bottom left was a husband and wife. They were having some uh, difficulties. And what uh, this video is, and I'm happy to show you afterwards if you'd like, is just how the student performed in the interview process, where they're, uh, and this is through our couples and family therapy, I think, or it might have been creative arts. But it, it talks about this, the student's position. If the student looks interested, if the student sits forward, if the student is uh, open, asking open-ended questions, what have you, to help prepare them to go out and, and start interviewing real patients. Okay, um, that's all I have. Um, again, for those of you that are looking for CME, am I saying that correctly? Why don't we go through a, a quick four uh, test and don't tell my students because I don't want to start reviewing this way with them as well. So simulation of four is participant safety by providing an environment where, is this a repeat from earlier this morning? That got the right test, don't I? Okay. Um, so uh, simulation affords patient participant safety, not patient, participant safety by providing an environment where learning and practical skill, uh, clinical skills without patient harm, learning and practicing clinical skills without participant harm, no errors are made, high quality equipment prevents patient harm. A, B, B. And what I mean by uh, 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 no participant harm is, is no psychological harm. Now, I'm going to fight with myself because you know what? If I'm going in there and I'm being measured to pass this course, or as a practitioner, if my skills are being called into question, I might have some harm. Uh, uh, but anyway, that's for today and to get credit, there, that's the answer. Theoretically. Um, simulation promotes patient safety by... Is this from this morning? No, I, I think this is, it's, it's like it. All right, so I heard a C. C? Anybody else? All right, there we go. Yeah, no, this is, this is a different quiz, I promise. Simulation strategies for human patient simulation include all of the following except. So what is the one thing that's not a simu simulation strategy or a simulation objective for the human patient simulation environment? A? Anybody else? A, it is. A, it is. Thank you. And lastly, 
According to Rudolph et al., Jenny, goals of debriefing and guided reflection should allow the participant to. We're talking about the guided reflection. The goals of guided reflection should be I think I heard an A, I might not have. I heard a D. Anything else? B? I'm not so bad at writing tricky questions, am I? <laughs> and actually, at first, uh, B was an unthreatening environment. And I go, no, that makes sense. So I changed it to threatening. Okay, so uh, that's all I have. Thank you for your time. And uh, I, I thank you for coming today on behalf of the, uh, the folks up here at UNMDJ. And, and safe travels.